If you look at it historically, when we have a lot of these birds being raised outdoors and you know free range system, they have more access to more fiber, more uh, more stuff, you know. Um, and gradually, we've stripped out a lot of this complexity in quotes, and then gradually we are trying to reintroduce a lot of those. Um, complexity in, in, in now we are we are bringing it back as feed additives you know so um in order to uh, help the best better and to stress so i'm looking at it from the stressful world Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, where we discuss the latest in poultry nutrition and research industry trends uh, in approximately uh, 10 minutes. My name is Sam Rochel. I'm a co-host for the day, Associate Professor of Poultry Nutrition here at Auburn University, uh, and joined by uh, a friend who's newly stationed uh, at Ohio State University uh, in a new position just this year. Uh, so we're excited uh, for that, uh, Dr. Ayodeji Adarabigbi, uh, who is a poultry nutritionist, both uh, or a non-ruminant nutritionist, working both poultry and and swine throughout his career. Uh, so, look forward to talking with you today, Io, and learn what you're uh, thinking about in your new role there at Ohio State. Uh, thank you, Sam, for having me. Um, you know, I'm enjoying it. It's it's been it's been cool. It's been good. Yeah. <laughs> it's a new area, but you know, I'm I'm enjoying it so far. Yeah. Good. Yeah, very good. Well, uh, we've talked a little bit about what we're going to discuss today, and, and you proposed uh, what, uh, a title that really kind of kind of caught my eye. So I'm excited to hear your, your thoughts on this. So uh, what you kind of propose to frame the discussion around is, you know, beyond corn and soy, you know, rethinking poultry diets in a stressful world. So, I mean, uh, it, it, what are what are you thinking about this as far as, uh, you know, maybe challenging the concept of a traditional corn soy uh, diet for poultry production in, in today's world? Yes. Uh, thank you for uh, for prefacing that. You know, um, as a nutritionist, we always want to put our birds in the right, you know, uh, give them the right nutrition um, and also try to meet those growth, growth metrics, you know, production metrics and bottom line for the producers and so on and so forth. Um, so traditionally, we've uh, given them something that they can extract as much nutrients as, as, as easily as possible. Um, but, you know, if you look at it historically, when we have a lot of these birds being raised outdoors and, you know, free range system, they have more access to more fiber, more, uh, more stuff, you know. Um, and gradually, we've stripped out a lot of this complexity in quotes. And then gradually, we are trying to reintroduce a lot of those um complexity in, in, in now we are we are bringing it back as feed additives you know so um in order to uh, help the best better and to stress so i'm looking at it from the stressful world and so in the stressful world in which the birds are now you know simple is not always better because um we are not able to create a good environment uh, by just, you know, having a very simple diet that can be robust enough across a lot of these commercial stressors, stress, handling stress, environmental stress that they see. And so we, you know, looking at it from that perspective, we're trying to see if we can, um, if we need to introduce a lot of more complexity, more heterogeneity into the diet to better complement the efforts in the stressful situations that the birds have found themselves. Kemen calls all poultry experts. You already know the key to a profitable operation is healthy, productive birds. Our team of poultry experts are driven by curiosity to develop science-backed ingredients and solutions that help you maintain feed and water quality, improve intestinal health, optimize nutrition, and eliminate pathogens. Learn more today by diving in at kemen.com forward slash poultry to learn more. There's there's a couple things that, that really caught my attention there that you mentioned. So um, one, just the, this concept of diet composition heterogeneity. So, you know, I'll ask you to kind of follow up on that. And then two, you know, we, we are probably more familiar with this concept when we talk about optimizing like the microbiome and, and, and you know, trying to maybe minimize pathogenic bacteria. But you're talking about even beyond that into to environmental stressors and how the 
diet complexity might help. So can you follow up on those those two points a bit? Yeah. So, um, you know, from the area I'm looking at it from, if you um, look at, you know, the U.S. diet compared to European diet, for instance, you have different cereal bases. You have corn in, in, in the U.S. that is the major cereal base. Um, and then when you go to European or maybe Canadian diet, you have the wheat base. Um, and... Um, of course, you know you. That is based on the geographical uh, abundances of those, you know, of those things. Um, but you know, uh, I've been thinking. I'm like, okay, uh, has there been any head-to-head uh, comparisons of those two kinds of diets? Uh, especially, I know they might have been in terms of pathogenic stress, but especially when it comes to common stress battery, you know, commercial production, and which one you know, gives those birds, you know, a better resilience metrics. Um, um, and that's how I've been thinking about, actually, I'm trying to design a study around that uh, to compare, you know, which one, you know, provides a better, you know, um, gut um, resilience. And of course, we know that the, the gut is, you know, some people will say the largest ecosystem in the bird. Uh, so essentially, um, are we given, are we pushing the guts as hard as we can to force them to, you know, have more diversity um, to be able to better handle stress. And that's the way I'm looking at it. Of course, you still have your practical diet. You know that the weight or more complexity will result in, you know, more or, le- or less uh, nutrient extraction or some dilution. So you still want to add some, you know, enzyme, you know, and stuff like that. But which one will better help the birds to um, modulates the gut, you know, and then the gut can have, you know, you have the gut bone axis, you have the gut lung axis, you have all sorts of things that the gut do systemically, you know, from the metabolites and all sorts of things like that, um, structurally just from the diet, you know. Um, and if we have to add, you know, some fiber, insoluble fiber sources as well, can we pre-process them? Um, in such a way that it opens up the fiber stru- structure for more fermentability, you know, for instance. And so how I'm looking at it, not from an additive perspective, I'm looking at it by the composition, adding a little bit more um, different ingredients. You know, it could be ingredients that have more functional properties like grape promises. It could be things that have little or no value in quotes, um, like in, in case of whole hulls or other hulls, grape byproducts that can, um, you know, apart from the motility, apart from the transit, that can also help in better fermenta- fermentation of the fiber to increase metabolite that can have some systemic effects. Um, so that's where I'm looking at it from. Okay. Yeah. So that was, you kind of led into my next thought was, okay, the concept sounds good. Uh, but then what ingredients do we actually have, uh, available to try to, you know, explore this approach? So you mentioned the, the great pomace, the oat holes, uh, basically fibrous ingredients is really what we're focused on. Yeah. A lot of the fiber, um, you know, it's fiber is very complex, <laughs> mm-hmm, you know, sure. yeah. um, and you know, I, I think, but it could be, it could beyond just gut motility, it could have a lot of use because a lot of the time, a lot of this uh, holes, like uh, uh, for instance, are uh, not being utilized. There was an experiment that was done, I think at Purdue University, and I keep mentioning these by Dr. Amica's group. Uh, and uh, you know that, that will help me to design some other studies as well, uh, where they you know try to increase the fermentability without solubility of um, pale meal fiber, you know, and, you know, what they saw is that, you know, they're able to open up the pores of those fiber. And if you open up the pores, if you know anything about fiber, the Cajun effect, you, you are able to utilize more of those fiber to create more, uh, metabolites. So, um, you know, but of course, you know, of, you know, dilution, the effect of dilution as well. So you are not trying to not meet the nutrient requirements of the birds. You know, you're still meeting the requirements. You're still trying to meet your production metrics. You know, um, you know, the simple diet, that's what they do, you know, but we are trying to increase those access, you know, like trying, trying to prime or train the gut to be more stable so that when 
things change, you know, in, you know, you have a hop cycle of eat, you know, the gut can easily adjust, you know, to help the birds better handle that stress. So um, great promises, for instance, too, you know, when I was at Florida, we had a lot of that, you know, muscadine cream promises. And I did some studies on that. Um, and I see a lot of health metrics, health benefits just by 1%, 2% inclusion, you know. Um, so that does not stop any uh, health programs that we have. It's just you know, you're trying to help the complement those efforts, you know, and so by 1%, 2%, 3%, um, you are able to really, really um, improve on those metrics, which translate to production metrics that you you want to see in your birds. Yeah, interesting concept. If someone wanted to kind of start uh, trying this approach today, obviously research is one step, but but otherwise, I mean, what what's something that somebody could uh, do today to kind of start thinking and working towards this concept? You know, I would say like for everything, you, you got to start little by little, you got to start uh-huh. small. Okay. Yeah, you don't want to yeah, just yeah. jump into it and, you know, um, and it's sometimes, you don't you know, introducing it to, you know, uh, uh, commercial operations, you know, can mean a lot of decisions. Um, so I would say try the little, you know, had a little here and there um, and, and see the effects, you know, uh, you can collaborate with, you know, research centers, with institutions to check some of those metrics and see if that improve your uh, bottom line and also the welfare of your birds. Um, but I would say try little by little. I uh, had 1% here, 2% there. And, you know, you can also target towards the finisher phase in terms of the broiler, for instance. Uh, that way you're not really affecting the growth curve of those birds when you do it early. Uh, uh, and so, you know, those are the times where you can save a lot of costs too, you know, uh, in terms of the feed costs, you know. So they are hitting a lot then, you know, they're very close to, to being slaughtered. And so by having that into the finisher phase, you are able to uh, save some money as well uh, and also get the benefits that you want to see in those birds. Very good. Ayo. This is uh, really interesting, man. I think it's uh, going to help some people think outside the box a little bit. I mean, again, this is, uh, you know, um, a, a different way of thinking about, you know, some of the same concepts that, that have been around. But uh, I, th- I think it's a it's an exciting way to think about it and maybe, you know, maybe. Uh, open people's mind to, to some alternative ingredients they may have access to uh, that, that we're overlooking. So I think it's a really good insight, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed this conversation and, you know, I've seen a lot of benefits from my little research, you know, in, in adding one or two percent or one or two more ingredients in, in, in the, I've worked with some, um, with some pasture raised birds and I've seen that sometimes when you transfer those birds in you know, the broilers, for instance, don't do the same with, um, with slow growers uh, outside. Uh, but, you know, by introducing a little bit more heterogeneity into their diet, by putting them outside, you see more bone metrics, more better bone metrics, you know, tibia metrics, you know, just by having some outside uh, access, you know. So, you know, just thinking outside of the box, trying to introduce more, little complexity into the diet um, can still meet the production metrics, but also help complement all the health efforts. So take home is, is diet complexity uh, may, may provide some benefits. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's not always a bad thing. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, uh, we'll wrap it up, man. Thanks again for sharing. Uh, excited to see where you go with this work and your new role. And uh, congrats again on that position and uh, excited for things for you there. Thanks so much, Sam. Thanks for having me. And thanks to everyone for listening. If you enjoyed the show, uh, please like and subscribe and follow us on your uh, favorite platform and we'll catch you on the next one.